Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, interviewing the one and only Mike Hurley Thank of you, Pen Addict and many other podcasts. Many. And we are here at the Atlanta Pen Show at 2016. And Mike, it is an honor to be able to sit down with you. Pleasure's on mine, sir. <laughs> You can tell he's got this sweet accent, right? That's yep. because he's from the UK. Came a long way. And I'm not going to lie, part of the reason that we wanted to come to the Atlanta show, we'd never been before, is because we knew you were going to be here. Oh, and we were like, he's flying all the way across the pond <laughs> to come here. Well, it's an hour and a half direct flight for us. So yep. let's make this happen. So I'm really glad you decided to sit down with us. Oh, pleasure's all mine. Pleasure's all mine. Very cool. So for those of who don't know who you are, who are you? So I'm a podcaster. That's what I do for a living now. Um, I have a company called Relay FM, and at Relay FM we have a bunch of shows. But probably the show that would be the most interesting to viewers of yours would be the Pen Addict, which is a show that I do with Brad Dowdy of the Pen Addict blog. And every week for like four and a half years, we just hit episode 200 this weekend. Uh, we sit and talk about pens and pencils and everything in between. Absolutely, and I was fortunate enough to be able to sit in on your 200th episode and I gotta say you guys nailed it like yeah. that was it was so great to just kind of see that be a part of that uh, so it's you know it's really cool so um, how did you first get into podcasting because that's a really important part of what you do so for me I think it's like how most people I know got into it I had a thing that I liked to talk about so like the majority of shows that I do are technology focused and I had a friend and every week we spoke about what was going on in Apple and stuff like that and we just decided why don't we just try and record this and see what happens. So we started to record it, this was in 2010 okay. um, and then since then I've basically just everything that I like, all of my interests, I've turned them into podcasts and for me that's worked out and then in 2012 uh, I met Brad for the first time, he was a guest on another show that I was doing um, and I just thought that he was awesome. I love talking to him, so I strong-armed him into starting a show with me about pens. Nice, yeah, from what I, I talked to Brad about this earlier, yep. and he said he was actually kind of resistant to the idea. He was. Like, Nobody's going to want to hear a podcast <laughs> about pens. Podcast about pens. We had a t-shirt made for episode 100 that said, a podcast about pens with a question mark. <laughs> That's great. That's fantastic. Um, so what drew you to podcasting as your medium of choice as opposed to video or you know written blog? So I tried to blog a bunch of times, and it's a difficult process for me to, to write um, because I feel like I go back and edit and review far too much and I'm really critical of myself and that so it takes a long time for me to get the words out but when I speak that's it right I just talk and it's like hearing a conversation I'm gonna say things wrong I'm gonna go back on myself but people are used to hearing that you know you, it's more difficult if you have typos in a, in a blog post or the grammar is incorrect people are, are kind of more resistant to that but when you're hearing somebody talk, people are just used to hearing the way that people talk. So for me, it was really easy for me to get my opinions out and not have to really fret over what was being said. And video, I've always kind of been interested in video, but the, the barrier to entry of video is, is harder. You know, to get a, a video that looks as good as the shows we produce, there's a lot of equipment involved, That's right, as true. you know. I know a thing about that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I think it's all about finding where your voice best suits. Exactly. You know, and I think you you do it very well. Thank you. So, how many different podcasts are you managing, and what, like right now versus kind of where your peak? Because from what I understand, you've cut back a little bit. Yeah. From your peak. So, there was a time where I think I was doing like nine weekly shows or something oh my like gosh. that. Gosh. Um, now I, I'm a part of like six or seven. Most of them aren't weekly now. Like they're every two weeks, which is way nicer for me because I get to kind of like do one on one off and can schedule my time that way but Relay FM has 20 shows in total but wow. I'm a host of like six or seven of them okay so since you're not hosting all of them obviously you have other people involved so like what does the team look like that's doing Relay FM so it's just me and one other guy Stephen Hackett he's my business partner and we manage everything together um, and then outside of that so like we look after the business right but outside of that the group of hosts that we've amassed over the last 18 months has been just a great group of people who love to work together. So it's kind of like just like a big group of people that are helping each other. So like everyone kind of has a part of it, right? And we all help each other to try and make it as good as it can be. That's wonderful. And this isn't something that you've been always doing full time. No. I mean, you've been doing this for a number of years. Yep. But only recently, relatively recently, mm -hmm. have you been doing it full time. What was that transition like? Yeah, so I've, you know, I was working in marketing 
uh, for a bank before this and, and I've been podcasting for six years and then about 18 months ago we were about about a month or two into starting Relay FM like I'd been doing podcasts in other avenues and it just got to the point where I was like I really like doing this and you know it looked like the, the, the advertising revenue was starting to come in and it was like if I don't do this now like my time's over like I'm never going to be able to do this so I just took the plunge and it wasn't difficult for me to adjust um, and, and I know that a lot of people can struggle with it but I was so focused on making it happen and I've been working like every night for five years before that for like six hours right like I was coming home and then working till 2 a.m. like that was just my life so all I did was just take that and just move it earlier in the day and it's uh, it's the best decision I ever made that's wonderful. like I, I love what I do and it's working out pretty good that's great so you have this show mm -hmm. the pen addict but would you really call yourself a pen guy it's I've been thinking about this a lot right? especially when I'm at shows like this because I get to meet so many people that know so much about this stuff but when I think about myself compared to the people that I know in my real life like they think of me like that right so right. Like, I remember when uh, in my office in my old office and my old job people called me the pen guy like they go oh you're the pen guy right like you yep. like the pens <laughs> Uh, and I would then get out like a, some case and be like, please choose your pen for the day. <laughs> so it's, but when I'm in these scenarios, like I, I don't, I just don't know as much as everybody else. Sure. So like I know that I love pens and if I was to call Brad the pen guy, like I'm not at his level, but I feel like over time he is helping me get there. Like when I, I was listening back to some of our earlier episodes recently and I kind of knew nothing. Like right at the very start of the show, and this is why we do suggest that like if you're really interested in our show, to try and go back to number one if you can. The, the way this, this show kind of begins is Brad is teaching me. And he still does, but like right in the very, like the first batch of shows, like he's just teaching me what I needed to know to just have the real basics of knowledge for this stuff. Over time, like I'm getting more and more committed into this. And I think I'm becoming the You're being guy. drawn I'm being in. Drawn in. Yes. Coming to stuff like this is the worst, right? Around right. all these enablers. Worst slash best, right? Yeah, worst slash best. <laughs> it's the best worst. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I had a similar experience in 2009. I went to the DC Pen Show. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to DC? No, you haven't? I'm thinking about it. Okay, well, that, put that one on your bucket mm -hmm. list because it's probably four or five times the size of this show. It's, it's massive. Uh, very different feel. Atlanta is very intimate, yep. and that's what I really like. This is the first time I've ever been to Atlanta, and it's been it's been really great. It's like a family here. Yeah, it is. You know, DC is kind of it's like going to family reunion. There's like all the cousins you never see and hardly know, and that kind of stuff. So, uh, it's a very different feel, but I think you'd have a blast. So anyway, put that on your list. Um, but yeah, I would say that uh, that feeling is probably how most people feel. Mm -hmm. You know, even myself included. You know, because I walk into one room with a bunch of vintage pen guys, and I'm like, I don't know anything compared to these guys. Yep. I talked to Andy Lambrow uh, yesterday, and I feel like an idiot. You know, he's talking about <laughs> techniques and various pieces of history, and then I sat down with Michael Saul today, Master uh -huh. Penman. I felt like a little kid. I'm just like, you know, we are actually late recording this very, this very video because I was so enthralled totally with Michael Saul. Totally worth Very worth it. Master I Penman, mean, you know. But it's incredible. I mean... So I empathize with you, but I would say, yeah, I would say um, what for me, I mean, I've followed you for a little while and you've always been like the podcast guy with the pen addict. And mm -hmm. I always, I always kind of mm -hmm. viewed Brad as the pen guy. But for me, as soon as I found out about this pen that you just got, yep. which I'm very jealous of by the yep. way, uh, the, the Pilot M90, uh, I think you can officially call yourself a pen guy. Yeah. You, ha you think you have like my blessing. I'm to officially call yourself a pen very guy. happy about this acquisition. Yes. Yeah, it's, I've had my eye on an M90 for a long time, uh, and I was able to secure one at the pen show. That's, that's fantastic. So I'm curious to know, because here in the U.S., we don't have a really strong fountain pen culture. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got, it's, it's very much a niche kind of thing. Like, we go to pen shows like this, and it's a lot of enthusiasm, but then we leave, and it's, it's like we're ghosts, and we're all individually, like, the pen person in our yeah. respective yeah, yeah. offices or families. Um, from the UK, you know, the European uh, culture is much more fountain pen immersive. Uh, how is it for you growing up in the UK? So there is definitely more 
fountain pens in schools in Europe, but it tends to be more in continental Europe. So like in France and Germany, they like in Germany, they have a massive culture for it. So okay. like Lamy make pens specifically for kids in school, right? Right. I think it's called the ABC. Yeah. So in the UK, when I was growing up, we were taught handwriting. We were taught what we call like joined up handwriting, which is cursive. Okay. And we did all of that and, and we used fountain pens to do all that. You know, but in but typically, I remember. I remember as a kid, it was I used. I had a fountain pen at home. Okay. Um, it was called the, the Yikes fountain pen. I found one on eBay a couple of, a couple of years ago. Nice. And they wouldn't let me bring it to school because they were scared I was going to make a horrible mess in the carpet. Okay. But like there is, I think there is more appreciation for it um, in the in the rest of Europe. But in the UK, I think it's pretty similar to the US, kind of in the culture of pens. Interesting. Because even when I was, you know as an adult using fountain pens people thought that was like an interesting choice right sure you know yeah here i mean just on the flight here i had to explain to the tsa agent in the security line what a fountain pen even was hmm. and she was the fountain like a water fountain i was like sure you know <laughs> if that like, helps me get no through the line <laughs> there's no explaining it you know so people don't even know they're like the thing with the feather i'm like yeah okay I'll just get my shoes off and go through the line <laughs> You know, so it's interesting to hear that the UK is so similar because I would think being like right next door to France and you know these other countries, I mean literally in France and other countries they're they're teaching yeah. kids in in schools uh -huh. with fountain pens, which we think about here and it's like they haven't done that in 50 years. We're way more influenced by you than Europe. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so you're here in Atlanta. Yep. It's obviously a quite a bit of effort for you to get here. Very expensive, I would say. It is, yeah. So what actually brought you to Atlanta? So last year, um, we, me and Brad decided that we wanted to do the show in person. We'd never met, right? We've been working together for like three or four years at that point. We'd never met each other. So we decided, why don't we try and make something out of this? So Brad was deciding to come to the Atlanta Pen Show for the first time with Knock. So we decided to do a Kickstarter campaign to help fund me to come over and for us to record a show in person in this hotel. So we cr not, not created a special case for it. Uh, we made, I, I can't even remember how much it was. It was something like $12,000 or something. It was wow. like an incredible amount of money. It's great. It brought me out. Um, we were able to do a bunch of fun things. We had like a party and stuff and we were able to kind of, we, we, every penny that came from the Kickstarter was either used to get me here and then to help fund things that here, right? So to give back to the people that gave us money. That's great. And so that was last year and we had such a fantastic time that we decided we had to do it again. So we did another Kickstarter campaign this year. We raised even more money. I think it was like 16,000. That's great. And we made these special notebooks this time, which are like embossed with a Pen Addict logo. And it just is like a really kind of emotional thing for me sure that there are people that will give money to us to bring me and Brad together yeah but this time we decided we had to go bigger so we did an audience for our 200th episode yeah we've now kind of worked out we were lucky right we hit episode 150 by accident last year right to do episode 150 in person so now we're like taking two shows off a year so every year we can hit another milestone oh, that's in Atlanta. Awesome. so the next one will be 300 that's great. Just don't get sick or anything, or you have to double up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like 300, like... you're gonna start doubling up. I thought you were talking Too about weak. cutting back, yeah. That's great. Um, so you did Kickstarter. What's that, what was that experience like with Kickstarter? Because usually, you know, it's for like making products and things yeah. like that. But... It's nerve wracking. Yeah. Um, the Kickstarter folks love our campaign. Uh, we, like they've, they've told us this, they give us this little badge because for them, it's a community event that we're creating. So that's kind of like at the heart of what Kickstarter began at. I mean, it's kind of morphed now into like, we're prototyping a product, we wanna sell you the product. But for us, it's like, a, we are a community. We have an event that we wanna put on. We can't do it without your support. And we're gonna give you something in return for helping us make it happen. So we record a video of the episode for backers and we get them books. But doing the Kickstarter is so nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know it's going to get funded, right? Like you don't know. Right. It was great last year. We were sure that people would want to give money again, but actually we had the exact same amount of backers both times. Like the backer figure was exactly the same, which wow. is very peculiar. Yeah. 
Um, so it, for us, it was like, we're really scared to do it every year. Yeah. Right? Because like, what if it doesn't work? But the, our, our listeners, they seem to just love to hear me and Brad being in the same room together. That's wonderful. There's a certain magic to that, you know, being yeah. in person. There's it's, just something about that. What we did last night, like, I can't get over it. Like, it's the first show I've ever done in front of an audience. And people were just really into it. Like, I'm going to be sad now to do a show without people laughing. Right. Have, hearing, <laughs> saying something silly and hearing laughter. Yeah. Like, as, now when I make a joke and it's just Brad going like, huh. You know, it's not going to be as good anymore. You need a laugh track like the old days, <laughs> well, I'm you know? thinking about that. Actually, <laughs> my girlfriend listened to the show this morning. She said it sounded like an episode of Friends. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But, yeah, it's just been an incredible experience. And I was amazed, too, because the whole time I didn't hear anybody cough. No one sneezed or farted or anything yeah. like that. Everyone was I mean, really was well amazing. behaved in yeah. that room. Very civil. Very civil. Very, <laughs> very conscientious audience, yep. I would say. That's good, wonderful. Good folk. Yeah. All right, so in the pen community, it's very enthusiastic, very passionate community, mm -hmm. and a lot of people do it. I mean, pretty much everybody starts out doing it just purely out of their own enthusiasm, and it's not about money. But at some point, you commit so much time to it that in order for it to be practical, you need to have some kind of sponsorship or get yeah. paid or yeah, something yeah. like that. And I know that's probably some feedback you've gotten. You have advertisements, you have sponsorships on your podcast. Um, do you ever get any, well, do you, have any, do you have any opinions about that? Because I, I hear some flack sometimes about once, once people get popular enough where they get to the point where they start to do some sponsorships, they get some initial kind of flack for that. Yeah. What's your take on that? So I think the sponsorship stuff, when we think about committing our time to something like this, at a certain point, there has to be decisions that you make. Like you have jobs, you have other side projects, you have hobbies that you want to do. If you want to keep a project going, you have to be able to weigh it up against other stuff that you do. So bringing in money helps you make the decision to carry something on. Right? So that's one of the reasons why the sponsorship exists for us. One of the things that we're really careful about, like as a whole company, as well as just in the pen addict, is who we bring in, the sponsors that we bring in. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, if our listeners lose trust in us, they're going to stop listening, and then there's no audience anymore. Right. right. So we're really careful about the kinds of companies that we bring in. Because we know, and we've seen it like with some of the sponsors that we have, we can sell out a product for them. So we want to make sure that our listeners are getting something which is actually good. Right. So we're very careful about who we let in, because we know if we lose that trust, it just goes away. Right? Yeah. People won't come back anymore, and then where's the business gone? So we, we take it very carefully to measure and weigh those things up, especially with something like the pen addict, because when we have sponsors that do make these physical goods, we kind of put in our name to them, right? To say like, yeah, we support this company, you should buy this stuff. If it turns out to be a dud, then it kind of, it makes everything that we talk about look bad. It, mm. We will lose respect. And that's so important to us, and especially to Brad, because, and I'm very careful with this, with him, is for me, The Pen Addict is one show in my whole range of shows, but it's the only one that I do about pens. Mm. The Pen Addict is like, a, it's another part of Brad's entire business, like with Knock and with the blog, and I take it very seriously not to undermine any of the work that he does, you know? Mm -hmm. So do you have any involvement, you know, with the Pen Addicts podcast and then there's Pen Addicts, the blog? Do you have any involvement on the blog side of things or is it purely just the podcast? Just the podcast. I mean, me and Brad talk about business together, right? Because we think quite a lot about these things. Like when he was looking at doing the membership, I was like giving him my opinions and really pushing him to do it. Mm -hmm. But the blog stuff, that's solely on him. I've written a couple of things for Brad, and, and, and he will always take anything if I do it, but just the writing stuff is like, I just can't. It's just you know? not your thing. No, it's just not my thing. Gotcha. So you've got a very engaged Twitter audience. Mm -hmm. That's where I see you most active. Yep. Um, but these days in social media, there's a lot going on. So what's your take on social media, and where are you kind of most active? Twitter for me, definitely, because with all of the audiences that I have, the real kind of overlap is there, um, especially because a lot of our shows are tech focused, right? So Twitter is kind of like the water cooler of the of our car corner of the internet. Sure. What, something that I find really interesting in the pen world is Instagram, 
that's the one, right? Like if you really want to go for that's the, the pen hot, stuff. That's the that's hot place right now, yeah. But I'm not as active on there in that way. Like I just post pictures of lattes and stuff, right? But, <laughs> but I can see where it's really interesting. Yeah. But Instagram doesn't make so much sense for some of our other shows. So Twitter is like the place where I put most of my efforts into. Okay. But I'm, with some new projects that I'm working on, I'm trying to think about other things that I can do. I'm trying to like break our mold a little bit. Like email newsletters, we don't. We have one for our members, but we don't really do much with it except for like their monthly membership email, which is, you know, we make sure that we keep that real tight because that's something that people are expecting. But like we don't have email newsletters per show or anything like that. So I'm thinking about what can be done there. And But Twitter is definitely our biggest focus for trying to put the word out. But in all honesty, I have no idea how well it works. Hmm. Like with a lot of these things, you're kind of just throwing stuff against the wall and seeing how right. it comes out. But I'd say, yeah, Twitter for us is, is our number one source of getting the word out about new stuff. Gotcha. Cool. So you've been involved with the Pen Attic now for four and a half years, mm -hmm. and it's, you've probably seen a lot of changes. I know I've seen a lot change just in the last year, really, with Brad coming to the DC show last year and the Atlanta show this year. I'm talking to a lot of people who've been to a lot of shows, and they're saying there's kind of a new vibe in the community in the last few years. What have you seen? I mean, granted, you. You maybe didn't know as much when you first got into the pen scene, but how have you seen it change over the last four and a half years? So, you know, I don't know if, if my opinion is, is like tinted in any way because of working with Brad so much, but I feel like he really is changing stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I think creating Knock and really pushing the blog more and him coming to these shows it seems to be changing some of the audience that exists at these shows. And like we know just talking to the people that have been to the Atlanta show for years, the age demographic has shifted dramatically. It has. And I think it's because, you know, Brad's audience is younger and that it's into newer products and like, you know, companies like Karis Customs, right, who are newer on the scene and there's a lot of this stuff starting to pop up. And I think it's starting to change stuff quite a lot. Like mm. and I I genuinely think he's at the center of a lot of this stuff, and you guys as well, right? Like it's younger audiences doing this stuff in places where young people are, right? Mm -hmm. So you're on YouTube, yeah. it's like a big thing for you guys. And, and I think that that is helping really change the makeup of these types of shows, and I think that's fantastic. Yeah. And I know that like for some of the people that have been around and doing this for a while, it's a tricky change, because we're kind of talking to people in ways that they're not working with like social media and podcasts like right. it's great to try and explain to people what we are doing here this weekend right like, you know, people are like you're from london why are you here right? like, what are you doing <laughs> yeah because it's always been like the local pen club it's, this is a local pen here. show right? maybe driving a couple hours yeah but yeah but i think it's starting to change stuff and i think it's great it is i've noticed that too i've felt that similar kind of vibe i mean we're seeing like young families mm -hmm. like coming together you talked about this in your episode 200 this family that came and visited yep. they drove five hours here together and their whole family is just crazy and depends and it's amazing to see that and see how inspired they are by your podcast like i assume that the bigger shows like dc and la maybe have a wider age makeup because they're so big right but i think the local shows like atlanta wouldn't have done like people weren't coming to the Atlanta Pen Show from other states, but now they are because we're kind of doing some interesting stuff with it and we're bringing people in. You know, like now you're coming, I bet you're gonna come next year too. Like, so as people start to come into it, like it's- It's been pretty great so far, exactly. I gotta say, yeah. It's, I think it's really great that it's raising the expectations of this show. Like they added another room this year. Yeah. You know, and I think it's fantastic. Like to try and make these local shows, put them on the map a little bit more, I think it's great. So do they have pen shows like this in the UK yeah. or in Europe at all? I've been to the London pen show. Okay. Um, and it was, it was quite stuffy, you know, like it was just, it was all vintage stuff and it was all older people. Like I was, easy, I was there for a couple of hours. I didn't see anybody near my age. Okay. Um, I think London's a difficult venue because the pen community is not huge, huge. Um, and the venues are so expensive to hire, yeah. right? It's like, I is there a pen show in New York? Because I imagine been a Long might... Island show, right? See, so yeah, that's. I, I imagine if you tried to do one in New York City, you'd have a similar kind I of problem. I can't imagine right? how expensive that would be. So I think London suffers from that, um, but 
you know, and I, I really wish that we, there was more. And you know, I think like maybe one day I could try and do something. Like maybe we can get Brad over to the. I was going to say, show. like, bring Brad, and then you'll have a show, right? You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's not our twenty seventeen, right? Let's bring go. Brad over to London. But there you go. I, yeah, I think it's great, and I think it's awesome that more people are coming together to try and really make this a more exciting place to be. That's great. So do you have any other, uh, like, pen, you know, like, Brad's obviously a very big part of the pen addict and the pen community. You know, we're active on social media and stuff. Do you have anybody else that you kind of connect with, the other podcasters or YouTubers or anything like that in the pen community? Yeah, there's a few, like, um, the bloggers that we really like, you know, um, and it's quite specialist stuff. Like, there's a, a blog that I love called Three Staples, which is run by someone called Ginny, and it's just field notes, photos, okay. which is just fantastic. And there's a, a great uh, UK blogger called Tessa Sowery, who has a fantastic blog that I love to read. But I'm way more connected to the US scene than the UK scene. Like I was talking to Tessa recently and I was like, oh, there's not really any good pen shops in London. And she's like, here's this list. And it's like, I, I'm way more connected to the US because of Brad. Mm. So like I know all the US vendors really well, you know, and, and that's way more where I sit than in the UK, which is similar for most of the things that I do because Everyone I work with in the US, most of our audience is in the US, so I'm like way more focused on here than home. Wonderful. So the Pen Addict has obviously been going for quite a while, 200 episodes, I mean, that is, that is a commitment yep. and a half. And is that your longest running podcast now? Oh, without a doubt. I have nothing that I've continued. Like, as I've moved from working with different podcast networks, the only show that stuck around is the Pen Addict. Hmm. The Pen Addict, Relay FM is the third podcast network that the Pen Addict has been a part of oh, in its wow. history. I can't ever see me not wanting to do this show. Like, I, I, I love it so much. So, and like, five years from now, you'll be like, it's episode 500, you know? <laughs> if Brad's willing to do it, I'll wow. still be there every week. That's wonderful. Well, I think that about wraps it up here for today, Mike. The sun is getting in our faces <laughs> here because we had to shoot outside by the pool and you're hearing trucks going by and all that. So thank you everybody who is hearing weird things going on in the audio behind us. And thank you, Mike, for being super flexible Pleasure. and being a part of this. So for those who are interested and in kind of learning more about you and following your stuff, where can they hear more about you? Um, so I think probably the viewers of this show will probably like to go to relay.fm slash penaddict. That's where you'll find the penaddict. We have a bunch of shows at Relay FM that you might enjoy. If you want to find my work, you can go to Twitter. I am iMike, I-M-Y-K-E on Twitter. So check it out. Very cool. Thank you, Mike. It has been an absolute pleasure. Pleasure's all mine, sir. Great to meet you. And thank you, everybody, for watching. If you uh, have any opinions or thoughts, I'd love to hear what you have to say. You can leave them in the comments on YouTube or on our blog. And if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, I highly recommend it because we're going to have this interview and others as well as other fantastic videos about fountain pens. So thank you so much for watching, and right on.